the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The 20th of the month, <coughs> Friday. Good uh, weekend to all of you, and we'll finish strong on this Friday. I know it's, it's the end of the week, and it's hard. Today is the 20th, as we said, the memory of the holy great martyr Stathios, the wife of Theopista, and his wife the Theopista, and uh, Theopista, and their child Agapios and Theopistos. This is the main uh, saint of the day, but we're going to talk about two other saints, because last year we did talk about Saint Eustatios, and it's good to cover all the saints little by little. The memory of the holy confessors, the icons, and the martyrs, Hippatios, the bishop, and Andrew, the priest. You remember the iconoclasm? What, what, what was iconoclasm, Mary? When the, they were like, destroying the icons. When they were destroying the icons. We have many martyrs. We have many martyrs. I had someone come to me yesterday. She's not or she was an Orthodox. She's Protestant, and she said, "I can't understand. Why do you venerate icons? What's that all about?" And I said, "Have you ever heard of the Seventh Ecumenical Council? Well, have you ever heard of iconoclasm?" So make sure we understand we're Orthodox. We have the ecumenical councils where there's martyrs. We we know to know our church history. Otherwise, we end up not understanding. Like the Protestants, they don't understand what icons are. They don't understand why people have icons. But if they only look at church history, they will immediately learn. And it's very sad that people are ignorant of our, our, the history of Christ's presence in the world. Also, memory of the holy confessors and disciples of St. Maximus, the confessor. Anastasios, the Apocrisiari, his disciples, Theodore and Evrepios, and Anastasios, the younger. We're going to talk about them today. Memory of the Holy Father, God, very Father John of Crete, the Holy Monk and New Martyr Hilari in the Cretan, St. Maletio, the Bishop of Cyprus, uh, the Holy Monk and Martyr John of Egypt and his 40 companions, St. Eustasius, the Archbishop of Thessalonica, and the Holy Confessor and Martyr Michael, Prince of Chernigov and Novgorod and Kiev, and his boyer Theodore, and we're going to talk about him as well. So let's start quickly because we want to cover a lot of ground. So, here is an image of the, of the, of the martyrdom of St. Eustathe and his wife and son. Uh, and the list of the saints. And here is the image of St. Maximus the Confessor uh, and his disciples, the life of St. Maximus. So we're going to talk about St. Maximus. Let's see. So we're talking about the great confessor of the church, St. Maximus, and his disciples. So we're in the 7th century... 7th century, which means we're in, uh, what, the 700s or the 600s? The 600s. In particular, about 650. 650, let's zoom in our little timeline here. So we're in this area here. Okay, 650. Before the 7th, actually just before the 6th. And uh, we're dealing with the monothelite heresy. These are the the heresy which said that Christ only had one will. We won't get into the whole theology, but this is a, a heresy that had taken over the whole empire. Really, the emperor and almost all of his bishops, with a few exceptions, had accepted this heresy. And the people who stood against it were very few. Were very few. But it doesn't matter if it's very few. Because God doesn't have need of numbers. He has need of faithfulness. Right? There are many times in church history when there were just a few left in the, in, 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 in the Old Testament as well. The, prophet, the prophets were killed by their, the Jewish people themselves, by the emperor, the uh, kings of the Jewish people themselves. So it's not the numbers, but it's the faithfulness. And here we have the faithfulness of the saints today. They were with St. Maximus and resisting this heresy, they were traveling with St. Maximus to different places, teaching the people about the danger of this heresy and the need to resist. And they went to Africa and to Rome. Let's go to Rome in our, in our map. Here is a, a map of Europe, and you can see where Rome is. Let's see if everybody's paying attention. Is Rome in, in the peninsula of Greece, Italy, or uh, um, in Spain? Italy. Go ahead. Italy. Italy, right. So you can see there on the map, right in the middle, here is Rome. <laughs> This was, for, of course, the center of the Roman Empire for a long time until Constantine the Great. And so in Rome, they went. Why? Because there was a holy bishop, St. Martin, Pope of Rome. Let's see their images here so we can remember. This is St. Maximus, an icon of St. Maximus, a beautiful icon. 
And this is an icon of St. Martin, the Pope of Rome. And we'll get to that in a minute. So St. Maximus and his disciples went to Rome. They had a council there, the Lateran Council, and there they anathematized the heritage. What does that mean to anathematize? Anybody? Anybody know what that means? Yeah, Mrs. Go against the things happening. Yeah. So literally it means they they lift it up to God's mercy or they lift it up to God's judgment. And and but in, in practice what it means is they said these people are no longer a part of the Church of God. They don't believe as the Church of God. We have no communion with them. And the reason why they do that is because, first of all, to protect the church from the disease, the heresy. Secondly, to help these people come to their senses who are no longer teaching the Orthodox faith. So it's both a loving and a just action. It's a necessary reaction against sickness. So when you get sick in your body, the doctor is going to try to isolate that sickness and then overcome that. Right? He doesn't want it to spread to the whole body. Otherwise, what happens? You spread the whole body of sickness, the whole body is debilitized. And so we could die, right? The body could die. So we, we war against that, we isolate it. And if the people who are carrying this disease and spreading it are totally unrepentant, then they must be removed. Otherwise, everyone else would get sick. And this is what was happening here. We had, but, that, but here in this case, it wasn't just a teacher in Egypt like Arios or one particular person here or there or even a patriarch. It was the emperor himself. The emperor himself and many, many bishops. In fact, really only the Church of Rome had remained faithful at this time, which is an Orthodox church, of course, an Orthodox bishop. So the emperor was very angry at this council, very angry at both, very angry at, at the saints, and he took them and he seized them and he brought them to Constantinople, and he tried to, to, to win them to a side with arguments and then with flattery and then he became angry and he started to threaten them and after they were they were tortured this is a christian emperor remember this, this is somebody who said i'm i'm following christ he's not a pagan emperor he's torturing the saints he sends them in exile to thrace Thraki, and that is so we have to go here our map and we get a little sense here so here is constantinople and he sends them to exile in this part, just get them out of there for the time being. And sometime later, about two years later, he calls them back, hoping that they repented. Well, they had not. They were steadfast. And so what does he do? He cuts off the right hand of St. Maximus. Why does he do that? Uh, and also he takes out the tongue. He cuts off the tongue of St. Maximus. Because St. Maximus, go ahead. Right, so this was both symbolic and practical. He wanted to show the world and to say, Maximus, that what you're doing is, is I'm going to stop. I'm not going to allow it to happen. Because his words and his writings were so powerful, and he was so respected because he had written many things, not just about this heresy, but he had written about the love of God and the spiritual life and philosophical issues. And he was very well known. He was very educated. And people listened to him, so he wanted to put an end to that. So he, he cuts off his hand and his tongue, and he sends him and his disciples into exile, this time to the Caucasus. Let's see where those are. Caucasus Mountains. All right. All right. So this time we're going from way over there up in here. This is the modern state of Georgia. So he's somewhere in the Caucasus. And they're in exile. It's really far away at that time. He probably traveled there. It took him months and months by walking or by somehow to get there. So now he's completely in exile with his companions. And, of course, after suffering and after being in exile, and he's an old man, he reposes in the Lord on the 662, 13th of August, at the age of 80. His disciples, who were commemorating today, Anastasius, uh, died at Thusum near Lazica, on 666, so it's four years later. And Anastasius the Younger uh, ended his days a little before St. Maximus when they were on their way there. Theodore, the third saint we're celebrating today, spent 20 years in exile before falling asleep in the Lord. While if Prepios, the fourth, died uh, after only one year. All of them, it says, fought the good fight. That's actually an expression from the writings of St. Paul the Apostle. The Apostle Paul said, 
I fought the good fight toward the end of his life. I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. And this is what they're referring to here. This is what our saints did. Patience in endurance. Pay attention, our older children. You will be asked questions about what we're talking about. He, he patience and endurance, uh, faithfulness, and you know, think about it now. The whole world essentially seems against you. The emperor of the entire, uh, you know, civilized Christian world is against you. That would be hard, wouldn't it? If you imagine, imagine just people in your household being against you. Imagine people in your village being against you. Your neighborhood being against you. How about how about everybody in the town being against you? Everybody in the state. Everybody in the country. No. Everybody, all the powerful people of the world, the President of the United States comes against you the, with the military, you put you in prison. This is very, very difficult. This is why what they achieved was a tremendous feat of faithfulness and patience. And they received the imperishable crowns of confessors of the faith. What does that mean, imperishable? Anybody know? What does perish mean, to perish, Mary? Like, to, like, not burn up, like kind of to yeah, to die, to, to be destroyed. Imperishable <laughs> means they were they will never be destroyed. So they received those crowns. Let's go to our second group of saints real quick, and this is uh, the memory of the holy confessor and martyr Michael, Prince of Chernigov. Where is Chernigov? Let's go to our map and put Chernigov in. All right. So now we're going up north. Very top of contemporary Ukraine, on the border with White Russia, Belarus, and Russia. I don't know why. Okay, and he was he was the uh, uh, ruler there in Chernigov, but he was also sorry from Novgorod. So let's see what that is. That's in northern Russia as well, between. Moscow and on the road to St. Petersburg. So this is where our St. Levy's in the 13th century. We'll go to our timeline and see where's that. Let's see. Sophia, where's the 13th century? Why don't you get up and come and show me where the 13th century is? And are we talking about the 1300s or the 1200s? 1200s. 1200s. Where is it going to be on, the, on our timeline? Just point. Right. So right, right here. Okay. So St. Maximus and those confessors are here. Now we're here on the timeline. So this is uh, in Russia, after it's been uh, hundreds of years of Orthodox Christians, and it's a time of great upheaval because we have, if we go back to our map, we have the Russian people here, but from these areas, there were these hordes of barbarians who were coming and attacking and destroying and were just ruthless, and they were coming and making havoc politically in this part of the world, and this is what the saint had to deal with. He was the prince of the area, and he had these wars that were being fought against it, and it, very quickly, because we don't have much time, he has a much extended life, of course, talks about it, all kinds of relations he had, and the struggle he had with the different princes, but what's important here is that there was a battle. He did not stay initially to fight, but later on, after they left, and he was, they were recovering, and these, these hordes, the, the leaders of the, of the Mongols were, or the uh, Tartars, I should say, they were, uh, they were expecting and they were exacting tribute. What does that mean? They said, okay, we'll leave you alone, but you will pay us. And you will, you will be obedient to us, essentially. We want money from you, and we want you to do what we want. You have to come here, and you have to make uh, obeisance, you know, show your allegiance to us. Otherwise, we'll come again. And so... They were debating what should we do. This is a difficult time. That they were somewhat divided. They didn't have a lot of resources, so they decided they will go. But they knew that this could possibly be a threat against their lives, and, the, and they have to submit to paganism. And so they were prepared for martyrdom, or at least Michael was. The others did not. So when they went there to see this, the Khan, uh, the re leader there of the Tartars, uh, they said to them right in the beginning, "Okay." Here, what you, here's what we want, we want you to do. We want you to perform a pagan rite. We want you to conform and do what we're going to tell you. Pass through fire and show your allegiance to the pagan gods. Well, he said, look, I'm, I'm fine as a ruler to respect your authority because God has placed you by his, allowed you to be here, but I will not worship your pagan gods. I will not bow down 
to idols. And he remembered, and his Theodore, who was martyred with him, reminded him of what had been spoken to them by the spiritual father before they left, and the, the words of the Lord. What did the Lord say? Everyone who acknowledges me confesses me before men. I also will confess before my Father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Actually, it's the Greek is very interesting here because it's confess in. So what is meant here is that whoever I dwell in and they dwell in me, and I through them confess. In other words, I my name is confessed. My my uh, my divinity is shown forth. The faithfulness of this person is shown before the world. Then I will be with them before my Father in the judgment. I will. We will be together. It's 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 as much about the action of confession as it is about the communion that they have with Christ. So you have to be in communion with Christ. And he was in communion with Christ. He had he loved Christ and he understood what what was the hierarchy of things. Listen to this. There's what's what's greater and higher: our life in this world or our eternal life. What's higher or greater, God or the rulers of this world? God. All right, so if you have that hierarchy and you have God within you, then you're ready to confess the faith. If you don't have that hierarchy and you're confused and you start to think, oh, I really want to be a ruler, I really want to have my, my uh, life in this world, whatever that is, and it's, it could be very good things. It could be wonderful things to have. I have a family. Uh, I'm going to be a just ruler. You could justify uh, making this. And that's exactly what the other princes said. They said, look, Let's just do this for the sake of the people and sin, and we'll repent. Is that right? Was that right? They did what they were doing. Well, they could say, well, God's merciful. He'll forgive us. What do you think about that? Will he forgive them? No. Yeah, he might forgive them if they really repent. But what does it mean to repent? To go and confess. So they weren't really serious about confessing. They weren't really serious about being faithful. They were just succumbing to the thoughts because they had other things that were more important than God and his confession. And so the saint here says, no, uh, I will not. I cannot do a pagan deed and be called a Christian. I will deny myself and my God if I do this. So he, he who had been weak in the hour of battle at one point now heroically offers himself for martyrdom. And he was beheaded after being tortured. In 1246, his relics were venerated with great devotion. In fact, after that, even Ivan the Terrible built a temple and put, or, or put his relics, in, rather should say, in the Kremlin, in one of the great churches there, and he's venerated and revered to this day in Russia because of his faithfulness. And he became kind of a, a flag of faithfulness during this very difficult time. So we have, every day, brothers and sisters, we have confessors and martyrs in the church. These are the examples for us, not because that they died and, they, and how they were tortured. That's not important. What's important is they lived in Christ, and then they were made worthy to be like Christ. Okay? So it's not about doing the right things only. It's not about keeping the law only. Sure, we're going to struggle to do that. We're going to absolutely struggle to keep his commandments, but all of that is for a point, and that is to be with Christ, to be in communion with Christ, to love Christ. If we're doing our prayers, our frustrations, our fasting, our almsgiving, because we think it's the right thing to do and not for the love of Christ, we're not going to have Christ in communion with us, right? We have to, it's everything's for Christ. So if you love someone, let's say your mother, your father, your brother, and they're suffering, they're in trouble, they need you, you don't do it because it's the right thing to do. You, do, you move, your heart is moved, and you run and help them because you love them. And this is what we need to struggle to strive to do, is to arrive at the point where we are doing things out of love for Christ, everything we do. So, we'll start with Markella, and then we'll go to Olivia, and Ioana, and Mary. These three, four, I want to, them to contribute to the conversation and tell me about the life. What are we going to take away from this today, Markella? Um, faithful. Be more specific. Let's see. I want to know if you miss it. And tell me examples in the life. Think about it. Olivia. Well, um, when the pagans wanted him to prove that he was to be a pagan, he denied. So he, he wasn't going to become a pagan, but he was going to show allegiance in this way. Correct. He denied it. He said, I can't remain a Christian. We're going to go to Yuan. Yuan? 
contribute? What do you got to say about this? What do you understand? What's the takeaway here? What made an impression on you? If it hasn't made an impression, you probably weren't listening. Mary. That like he even he didn't get like even though he could have still been like the prince, he did it. He gave that up. So the other the others were going to going to do it. All the others were with him and saying, "Come on, what's the big deal?" Does that happen among young people? All the time. It's called peer pressure. They come and they say, come on, we can do this. Nobody will find out. Your mom and dad won't know. Well, that's not how you become someone who's revered and a saint of the church. Anastasia. He had great, um, say that, he had great um, patience when he got exiled two times. St. Maximus, yeah, and his disciples. Great patience. Great patience and faithfulness. Go ahead. Great boldness before Christ. He had, he had bravery. Bravery, absolutely. Mary? Did the other princes like go through the fire ap like, after they, they had They had either gone or were about to go, yes. Otherwise, they would have been martyred as well. Okay, afterwards, actually, the Tartars changed their, their methodology, and they did, not, they did not force a lot of them to offer to the pagans. Uh, because they wanted the money. They wanted the, the, the obedience, so they avoided that. They were very practical in that way. But I think part of that is because of the fruitfulness and the, and the, uh, the grace that God gave through the martyrdom of, of St. Michael. Mark Kelly, you have anything to say before we close? Um. Yeah. You need to pay more attention, think on your own, bring up questions, because these lines are... Uh, potential potentially for you can be very helpful and inspiring and encourage you in the spiritual life if you pay attention and you take to heart what you're listening to. This is Christ in the life of the church throughout all the ages and that's how we draw, draw close to Christ is when we draw close to his saints. So the prayers of our holy martyrs of Jesus Christ by God in verse 16. Amen. Lord Jesus